I tell you, it's simply wonderful, the communication that we have these days. Now, during the Feast of Tabernacles, I was able to speak to you on the opening day, and again on the final last great day, all of the churches, all of the camps, uh, feast sites, that is, all over the United States and all over Canada, and then the first day to England also and Hawaii, and uh, last Sunday, or last Sabbath, I should say, not Sunday, a week ago today, I... Uh, spoke from Jerusalem to the church in Pasadena. It was night in Jerusalem, but I spoke to the morning uh, church in Pasadena, and there they recorded what I said, and it was replayed again for the afternoon service in the auditorium in Pasadena. Now, two weeks ago, we had a great meeting uh, of the brethren in London. I think there were brethren only from around the London area. I don't think your brethren came down from up in northern England or Scotland or North Ireland, but there were a few who came over from Germany and other uh, countries on the continent of Europe, and we had more than a thousand, and uh, I thought they had gotten the, uh, the message that I gave on the last great day of the feast. I found out they had not, and the ministers there asked me to give them that same message, and so I gave that to them two weeks ago today. And uh, we had a wonderful meeting there in London, over a thousand of our people. I don't know how many of you are out in New York, but I would guess that there must be a thousand or more of you there listening right now. Now, the following Monday night, after speaking in London, I spoke, and that was just uh, the following Monday, from the Sabbath, just the day after tomorrow, you might say, I spoke to a very large banquet in Cairo. I spoke for a half hour or longer, and uh, there were uh, about 300 or more there. It was a large banquet, many, many tables with about uh, eight or nine or ten seated each round table, and uh, many of the tables filling a great grand ballroom. And they were the top people of Egypt. And uh, uh, I spoke quite a while to them. Then at Jerusalem last Monday, uh, I had a good private meeting with Prime Minister Begin. Uh, I was accompanied, of course, as I always am, by Mr. Rader, and also the mayor of Jerusalem, Teddy Kollek, mayor of Jerusalem. And by the way, he had been speaking on the national network, the ABC network from New York, just uh, about uh, ten days before. But he was back in Jerusalem, and he went along with us to the Prime Minister in the Prime Minister's office. And uh, incidentally, Prime Minister Begin was in a very important meeting in, uh, in Tel Aviv. Now, it's a one-hour automobile drive from Tel Aviv on up to Jerusalem. Jerusalem, you know, is up higher. It's about 2,250 feet elevation, whereas Haifa's right down on the seashore. And uh, the Prime Minister left his meeting with several important people in Tel Aviv. He drove an hour to come to Jerusalem to have the personal meeting with me, and, uh, and then another hour's drive back, and for that two and a half hours or a little more, he just left his people of his important meeting in Tel Aviv just waiting for him. And... Uh, I mentioned how sorry I was that he had to come and all of that thing and come out of the meeting and come all that distance to get to see and talk to me. He said, Mr. Armstrong, I would get up in the middle of the night to talk to you. Well, that sort of warmed my heart a little bit, too. Now I'm to have a meeting next Tuesday with President Sadat of Israel. Now, I know you've all, of course, read a great deal about how President Carter got Mr. Begin of Israel and the Prime Minister and uh, President Sadat of uh, Egypt together at the White House and up at the uh, Camp David, and uh, got them together and had them photographed together with him and all of that. Well, I'm not going to get to have them photographed together with me because Mr. Sadat will be in Cairo while Mr. Begin is in Jerusalem. But I tell you what I am going to do. And uh, I already have the permission of President Sadat for it, and I told this to 
Mr. Bagan, and he was glad to have me do it. He says, that will be fine. I'm going to give them a cover story on the plain truth, and I don't know whether it'll be possibly the February number. Uh, and uh, I don't know just which number. It could be March, but I think probably February. I will have the two of them pictured on the front cover of The Plain Truth. And then I'm going to write quite an article in about my meetings with them and about the whole situation in the Middle East. Now, that is a boiling pot to the whole world right now. That's where the trouble spot is. Not anywhere else. It is there. And uh, I know the world has been looking on uh, the United States the last few days because just, what was it, three days ago, four days ago, we had the election. And incidentally, I'd like to say a few things about that. Now, the governments of this world are all the ideas of human men. What Adam and Eve did in the Garden of Eden, they took to themselves from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Instead of letting, letting God give them the knowledge of what is good and what is evil and tell them what is sin and what is righteousness, they said they would decide for themselves. They would manufacture the knowledge in their own minds of what they thought was good and what they think is evil. So their children are the world. You look at the whole world today, four billion people and more. And, you see, last December I was speaking to the top leaders of one-fourth of all of those people in China. And one of the vice chairmen in China, there are two vice chairmen and uh, uh, a chairman who run the government in China, and uh, uh, I was speaking to uh, one of the two vice chairmen, and they are molding the thought, the thinking, the believing of one-fourth of all of the people on earth, one billion people. That is a lot of people. God has opened doors for me to see more heads of government, more presidents, more chairmen, prime ministers, more kings than any other man in the world. Nobody else except Mr. Rader, who always goes with me, has ever seen as many. I have seen them in South America, I've seen them all over Europe, I've seen them in South Africa, in West Africa, in East Africa, in North Africa, I have seen them in the Middle East, and I know the Arab leaders, I know King Hussein, I know President Sadat, I know the President, or who was the President, but he still really acts as President, though he officially resigned of Lebanon, and uh, spent a day with him in his mountain uh, home up in the, in the mountains, uh, and that's before the great trouble in uh, Beirut, and uh, Beirut has been practically destroyed by all that trouble that has happened since. But I, I did have quite a, quite a whole day's visit with the president there. And uh, with those in Asia, with the uh, emperor of uh, Japan, with the head people of China, with the top people in Korea, and... Uh, uh, with the president of South Vietnam before he had to move out and the communists took over. And so it goes. Now, just the day before yesterday, uh, Mr. Rader and I had luncheon once again with King Leopold III of Belgium. He's a very dear friend of mine. He's been a guest in my home out in Pasadena. And uh, I had not seen him now in almost four years. And uh, it was nice to see him and his wife in their home uh, at the Chateau. And incidentally, they uh, are uh, living at or, or just adjacent to Waterloo. Now, Waterloo is where Napoleon had his final defeat. They call it his Waterloo, as they say. Well, that's where Napoleon was finally destroyed and the government that he had had of the so-called Holy Roman Empire. Now, that's what we're expecting next over here in Europe, is that uh, there will be a union of ten nations going together in Europe, and uh, the Pope at Rome will sit on top of the whole heap. There will be one man over all the governments. There will be a king, or I don't know what they may call him, a president, a prime minister, whatever term they give him, I don't know, over each one of the ten nations. Now, I did think... Let me just say, I did think that Belgium and Sweden and Norway and uh, countries like that would be in it. 
And I have sort of changed my mind a little bit. You see, the Bible doesn't tell us just which nations. The Bible only tells us there will be ten. And it doesn't tell us which, and so I can't know. But now I'm beginning to think that the Polish Pope may bring Poland in. And they're having labor trouble right now. It's in this morning's newspapers right over here in Paris. There's going to be another labor trouble in Poland. And uh, as you know, that uh, Romania is, is not uh, really very enthusiastically with uh, the Soviet, and uh, neither is Yugoslavia. And uh, I can begin to see some of those nations breaking loose from the Russian orbit and going in and instead of the Scandinavian nations, they will go in with France and Germany and with Spain and Portugal and Italy and form the ten nations with the Roman... And, and that will be the same territory that was occupied by the old Roman Empire. That is coming along. Now, I have, uh, as I said, a meeting scheduled in Cairo on next Tuesday with uh, President Sadat. And incidentally, our whole television crew are over here, and uh, they will be uh, on Monday you know, getting in, getting their cameras all set up and everything for this, as they did, and we were completely photographed in the meeting with, uh, uh, with Prime Minister Begin of Israel. And uh, I am doing what I can to help bring about peace between these nations, but I tell you, brethren, there is not going to be any peace until Christ comes and gives us all peace in the government of God. The governments of the world today are on a competitive basis. Everybody is living in a competitive manner, one person against another. In sports, it's all competition. In politics, it's all competition. Brethren, let me tell you something. You may not realize this. I have said it before, but maybe you didn't quite get it. Do you know who first started this idea of taking polls of pu public opinion? Do you know who started it, who the real starter, the founder of that was? It was myself. I did it back in the year of 1915, and that's before a great many of you were born. And I did it for a national magazine. And I can show you yet copies of that national magazine publishing that report of uh, uh, merchandising and retail conditions in the little town of Richmond, Kentucky. Then I made another survey up in Lansing, Michigan. And after that, I made surveys in other cities. And I started this thing of making surveys of public opinion. And let me tell you, I have known all along, and I was writing newspaper editorials on a newspaper back in 1933, in 1932, I mean, in 1932. And I was showing that the polls were not predicting who would win the election that year, and they didn't. You remember that was the year that FDR, Franklin Roosevelt, was running against Hoover. And the polls said it was about even, and I knew it was not going to be even, because I said the polls are not accurate. You know why? They don't know how to do it. They don't get information from a large enough percentage of all the people. And they don't get information from the right percentage of each block. For example, in the vote, we have the Catholic vote, the Jewish vote, and the Protestant vote. We have the black vote, the white vote, the capital vote, and the management vote, the labor vote. We have this vote and that vote. Well, you've got to know what percentage of the people are in each group and how they go. And they don't do that. They just take a few here and there. And they don't know how to take a poll. But I did start all this poll business regardless myself, and I know something about it. Well, I won't take time because I know there is going to be a sermon, and Dr. McCarthy is there, I understand, today, and I don't want to take up his time. So I'm going to stop right here. I'm, I'm sure you all know, I, I must say a little something, the state of California has dropped the lawsuit against God's church. I'm sure you all know that. And there will be something about it, of course, in the plain truth and in the worldwide news. And I just sent something in uh, that I just finished writing since I've been here in Paris. 
and uh, where we're just stopping off so that we can go up and see King Leopold and have lunch with him. And uh, then we're on our way tomorrow back to Cairo, Egypt, for the meeting with President Sadat. Now, I'll get to you in New York when I can, but the governments in this world are all influenced on the idea of get. Now, every vote group, I mentioned all these groups in the vote, every group wants to get what is right for them to get for their interests. They don't care what happens to anyone else. What about the politicians? Well, they want to get the vote. They just want to get the power. And that's what it was in the lawsuit against the church. There was the attorney general of California. He wants to be the governor. He wants more power. He's going to run for governor next time. Well, his lawsuit against us didn't advance him like he thought it would. It hurt him. Anyhow, uh, we did have a little something to do without playing any politics. We had a little something to do with the California legislature making void the, the, the law on which the attorney general based his whole lawsuit. He was going to take over our church, and if we went, every other church would have been taken over by the governor or by the government of California. But uh, uh, now he doesn't have a leg to stand on, so he dropped the lawsuit, and we have won a great victory there. But always is the ecstasy of winning the agony of losing. President Carter and his wife Rosalind went into a room and in agony they burst out in tears and they just cried aloud. It was so hard. And of course Mr. Reagan is all up in ecstasy. And I had to think, four years ago Mr. Carter and his wife Rosalind were in ecstasy. And President Ford and his wife were in agony. And they were probably crying tears because they lost. Now, did that spoil the ecstasy of President Carter? No, I don't think it did. He was so happy that he won, he didn't care if it did hurt them. Or is that true now? I know that's a pretty strong statement, but just think about that a minute. That is the way Satan has got into all of us. He's got it into our minds. We don't care what happens to the other fellow. The average person says, well, I don't feel it if he suffers. That isn't making me suffer. I'm not suffering. What do I care if the other guy suffers? Brethren, in the kingdom of God, we're going to care if the other man suffers, and we're going to try to keep the other man from suffering. We're going to try to have all of us enjoy the ecstasy and nobody having to enjoy the agony. You know, our troubles in this world are all spiritual, and people don't know that, and they can't think spiritually because they don't have a spiritual mind. And they don't, you can't have a spiritual mind without the Holy Spirit of God, and the people in the world don't have that. So until Christ comes, and until he sets up the government of God, and incidentally, the only place on the, in the world where for hundreds and hundreds of years where the government of God has been effective is in our church right now. And the government of man was trying to destroy that government. God didn't let them destroy it, and we have won that great victory. God is still on his throne, and don't you ever forget it. Well, brethren, I'll come and see you when I can. I can't tell you when that'll be. Uh, I don't know whether it'll be next month or next year, or longer. I, I, I need to go so many places. I need to see so many of our brethren in churches. I'll get to you when I can. I do think of you. I pray for you daily, brethren. I think of you a lot, and I need your prayers. So I'm going to turn everything over now. I'm taking some of Dr. McCarthy's time, and I mustn't take any more. Thanks for letting me talk to you from Paris, France. It's a... Uh, it's afternoon here, it'll soon be dark, and the day is almost spent over here. The Sabbath day is gone. We're still going to have another little Bible study before sunset, and uh, so you go ahead and have your service there. So bye-bye, everybody. God bless you all. Okay, now we're having a little Bible study in the Sabbath over here in our apartment in the Plaza Athene Hotel in Paris, France. Yesterday it happened that I had mentioned something about the governments of the world, 
and about uh, the way governments were 2,000 years to 2,500 years ago and on to now. And I would like to go into some of the prophecies along that line. And since this is being recorded and many people are going to hear it, I think I have not gone into a subject of this kind for a long time now, and I think it might be uh, quite interesting. First, let me preface it this way by saying this. Before all things else, where did everything come from? Here we are, people, and we, we're we only here for a little while. We have to eat food and drink water to keep going, to give us fuel, to give us energy, to live and work with. We have to have a heart in each one of us to pump blood all through our system. We have to have lungs to breathe air, and the blood goes through the lungs on the way back to the heart. We have many systems in the body that have to keep going to keep us alive. So there's the circulatory system of blood. There is the digestive system that digests our food. The eliminative system. Some of it has to be eliminated that isn't burned up and used in energy and in work. And uh, the many marvelous things in the human body. And then there is the human mind. But what happened? This didn't just happen. It had to be designed. It had to be planned. And someone had to think it out. And someone had to produce it. Now, before all else, you read in First John, or not First John, but the book of John, in the New Testament, where we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which are really the biographies of the life of Jesus Christ. And uh, the beginning of John, which originally was really the first book in the New Testament. Now we have it the fourth. But it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was also God. Now, word is translated from the Greek word in which it originally was written by John. It was written in the Greek language, and it means just what it says, word, or it means a spokesman, the one who speaks. But he was God, but he also was with God. Now, there are two personages, and they both are God. But the one is the head of the other. And the one that was the word, we read in the 14th verse of that same chapter, was made flesh, in other words, born as a human be being, and dwelt among us. Then he was born as Jesus Christ about 1900 and little, about 1970 or 80 years ago or 90 years ago. He became Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus Christ had been God. They had always existed. Your mind can't conceive that. It, it's impossible for you to really believe that. I can't believe it, but I know it. someone had to always live. And God had great supreme superior mind. He could think. He could plan. And they had to think and plan. And you know, they might have been thinking and planning for thousands, it might have been millions of years before they decided on what to create and what to make and what to produce. The first thing they created were angels. Now, God is a spirit. Christ was then with God, and he was a spirit. He hadn't been born as a human being yet. They were composed of spirit. They didn't have a heart pumping blood. They didn't have to eat food for fuel. They had always existed, and they had self-containing life. But they had to think, and they had to think out what they wanted to create and design and plan it and design it. They created angels. They set angels on the earth when they created the earth instead of man. That's long before man was created. And so they set angels here. Now, there's one thing God could not create, and that was character in those angels. And their creation was not complete until they had formed a character one way or the other. Now, either they had to form a character that is holy, righteous, perfect, 
without anything wrong in it whatsoever, and a spiritual character or a wrong character. God could give them mind, and he did. But he could not, if, if he had made them so they had to be right and have a right character, it would be just like man making a machine. It has to do what the man makes it do. It can think. And in order to have personality, in order to have character, in order to, to, to be personal beings, God had to make them with minds that could think and that could plan and uh, that could uh, make decisions. And they had to decide, if they were to have the good character that God had, and God had the perfect character, always deciding and uh, doing the right thing, then they had to decide that for themselves. God put them on earth. Now, he put angels on earth. And apparently, he put a third of all the angels on earth with them. And the angels had to develop character. Now, to do that, God, to govern their lives so they would live the right way and so they would have peace instead of always having conflict, they would have harmony instead of disharmony and war, they would build up instead of trying to tear down and destroy, God gave them a way of life, and he made that way of life a foundational law. He gave them a government. Now, you cannot have a government without a basic foundational law or a constitution on which your government is based. In the United States, we have the Constitution of the United States. We have one for every state in the Union. There is a basic law for every city, for every county, for every state, for every nation. The basic law of the government of God is simply the way of life that is summed up in the one word love, but it is outflowing love, not incoming love, because then incoming love is lust. And I don't like to use the word love because people today call illicit sex love, and that's not love at all. That is uh, that is lust. But it's outflowing. So I use the word give to show it's out from yourself. And the transgression of that way, or the wrong way then, is get. And I use the word get and give. That makes it simple. People can understand. And as I speak to people in foreign nations and before uh, crowds of people in foreign nations, I use the terms give and get, and they can understand that. So God's basic law and the basic law of the government he put over those angels was love, outflowing love or give for everybody. It's the way of cooperation, not competition. It's the way of serving not being served. It is the way of sharing, not taking away from other people. The way of helping, not hurting other people. The way of building up and building together with other people instead of destroying and tearing down. Well, so God set the angels on earth and he set this Lucifer on the throne of the whole earth. And Lucifer was set here to administer that government of God and administer that basic constitution or way of life, which is give. But Lucifer rebelled. Lucifer said, I think God is wrong. I think that competition is better. I think, look at the ecstasy you get from winning, from competition. Now, I've just been talking about the ecstasy that... Uh, uh, Mr. Reagan just had here, uh, what was it, three or four days ago, on the great landslide victory when he won. But there was the agony that poor President Carter had to suffer. And President Carter and his wife, Rosalind, went into a room alone, closed the door, and others could hear them just crying aloud in agony. But, you know, I had to think, 
Four years ago, President Carter was in ecstasy because he won, and Gerald Ford and his wife were in agony because they lost four years before. Do you think that hurt Mr. Carter's ecstasy? No, he was enjoying the winning. He didn't care. The fact that they, that the Fords were suffering didn't hurt Mr. Carter, did it? Well, I wrote something about that earlier today, and I said, I wish that Mr. Carter might be able to read what I just wrote. Because he would say, it's no skin off my nose. It didn't hurt me. The other guy suffered. But now, maybe it's not hurting Mr. Reagan any that Mr. Carter is suffering. In our way of life is the way that that... That super archangel, Lucifer, that God put on the throne, he rebelled and wanted the getaway. says, I'd rather take and have. It isn't going to hurt me if the other guy suffers. What do I care if he suffers? I want to have everything for myself. So he became Satan the devil. But he is still today sitting on that throne. Now, Satan, he was the former Carib Lucifer. He is an immortal spirit being. He's not a human being like we are. He doesn't have a heart. He doesn't have to eat food. He has self-containing life, and he still lives even today. He was living when Adam was put on the earth 6,000 years ago. He's living it today. So then God created man on the earth. Well, the earth had become rather devastated, and God in six days renewed the surface of the earth, as you read in the 104th Psalm and verse 30. But he prepared it for man, and then God created man. And the first man, Adam, was given a chance to restore the government of God to the earth. But to do that, he had to reject the way that Lucifer had gone and the angels. He had to go the way of God's character, the way of love. But he let his wife Eve be deceived by Satan. And Adam went right along, and Eve grabbed him by the nose and says, You come along here with me, husband. We're going to take to ourselves the knowledge of what is right and what is wrong. So they took of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the Garden of Eden. They rejected God. They rejected the way of God. They rejected the government of God. Now, let me tell you why that's so important. The only place on earth today where the government of God has been restored, like God put it originally, is in the church of God, the worldwide church of God. And this whole thing of the state of California and its lawsuit was an effort by the governments of Satan to destroy the government of God. That's what it was all about. I'm nothing. I'm a nobody. But God did call me, and Christ has been using me, and opened my mind to see this and to start the church based on a government and on based on that law of give instead of get and to teach that way and that's what we're trying to do and trying to live satan is the one who is ruling now adam was the progenitor of the whole human race he had children they had children their children had children and the whole world has come from adam and eve Adam and Eve made the decision for this whole world. And they made the decision to reject the government of God and the way of God and to go the way of Satan. So look at our sports and athletics. One team wins, the other team has agony. The one has ecstasy and the other has the agony. Everything is competition and strife, trying to hurt one another in this world. It's a wrong way to live. But the world is living that way. That lawsuit against the church was merely Satan using one of the governments. You see, God said to Adam, You have made a decision for all of your children, and all of your children will be the whole world, as it will be when there are four billion people on earth. 
And you have made the decision. All God did was make what Adam had decided binding. Adam made the decision, not God. Adam cut all of his children off from God. They're cut off from God. They can't reach God. They can't know God. They don't know about God. And Jesus Christ said, No man can come to me except the Father draws him. God the Father who sent Christ. The, the world is cut off from God. Now then, God said, you go and form your own governments. I won't go into the rest of it. They were to form their own kind of society and their sports and everything else. But I, we're going to talk about government for a little while now. He said, go form your own governments. Satan had been the one who was to administer the government of God, and he had put a different kind of government on, and Satan didn't want God's government on the earth. Adam had turned to Satan in Satan's way, and Adam's children were going to be led by Satan, and they were cut off from God, but they weren't cut off from Satan. Oh, no. So men formed the governments on the earth. Now we come along to about the year of 604 B.C., 604 years before Christ. And I want to read you a little now from the book of Daniel. In the very first of Daniel, beginning the first chapter in the first verse, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, now he was a king of Judah, and they were still living in uh, Judea, and the king Jehoiakim was reigning in Jerusalem, where we just were about four or five days ago. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, who was the king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. Now, Nebuchadnezzar had now raised up and organized the first world empire, the greatest government that had ever existed since Adam was created on earth. And... He came to Jerusalem and besieged it in war. Now, he conquered it, and he took the Jews, slaves, to Babylon. The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into Nebuchadnezzar's hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he'd carried, and so on. Now then, and the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel, of the king's seed, and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but well favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understanding, science, such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace and whom uh, they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. In other words, those Jews were just a little bit smarter in their minds than the other people, and the king of Babylon knew it. And he said, pick out the most brilliant young Jewish people and bring them over here, and we can use them in our government. So he took four. There was Daniel and his three friends. I just wanted to show you a little bit there. Now, farther in the uh, first chapter, we read this, beginning with verse 17. As for those four children now that were selected, it was Daniel and Shadrach, Mesach, and Abednego, his three friends. Uh, as for these four children, or while well, they were grown men, they were about like uh, the two young men we have right here in the room with us, uh, uh, Kevin and Aaron Dean. Uh, who are both married and have children, but they're still young men. As for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in visions and dreams. Now get that. Daniel had been given understanding in visions and dreams. Now then we come to the second chapter. And I just want to give you a little of it here, and we'll get through it as fast as we can. In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, now Nebuchadnezzar is the big pagan king up in Babylon, over in pagan Babylon, where their religion was the 
Babylonian mystery religion. Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams, whereon his spirit was troubled, and his sleep break from him. Then the king commanded to call the magicians, the astrologers, and the sorcerers, the Chaldeans, to show the king his dream. So they came, and the king said to them, I have dreamed a dream, and my spirit was troubled to know the dream. And then spake the Chaldeans to the king, said, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we'll show you what it means. We'll tell you the interpretation. The king answered, and he was just a little too smart for them. He was going to try them, and he was going to put them to the test. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, Well, the thing is gone from me. I don't remember my dream. I don't remember what it was. If you will... Uh, not make known unto me the dream with the interpretation of it. You shall be cut in pieces, and your houses shall be made a dunghill. But if you show me the dream and the interpretation thereof, you shall receive of me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me, tell me what I dreamed. And when you tell me, it'll come back to me. Well, they answered again and said, Well, let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will show you the interpretation. But the king answered and said, I knew, I know of a certainty that you would gain the time, because uh, you see uh, the thing is gone from me. But if you will not make known to me the dream, there is but one decree for you, for ye have... Uh, prepared lying and corrupt words to speak before me. So he was going to put them to death, in other words. I won't read the rest of that right there. But uh, they told him that there is no one but the gods that can show you what you dreamed. We're, we're only human. We can't do that. Well, anyway, they were going to be put to death, and then it finally was discovered that God had given Daniel skill to know dreams. And Daniel was brought before the king. And uh, these, these uh, other astrologers and fortune tellers, they, they wanted Daniel to do it because it would save their lives for them. Daniel was brought to the king, and Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, I'm over in verse 27 now, and said to the king, The secret uh, which the king has demanded cannot... Uh, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers say to the king, But, Daniel said, there is a God in heaven that reveals secrets and that will make known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Now, he's talking about something that's going to happen in your lifetime and mine, right down here in the end of this 20th century. Now, that's why it's important for us today. Something that will happen at the latter day. The dream and the vision on your head were these. Then he told him that there was a great image that he saw. It went way up like a skyscraper in the sky. A great, huge image. Let me give you a quick description. Thou, old king, sawest, and behold, a great image. This is verse 31 now. Verse 31. The great image, whose uh, brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. This image's head was of uh, fine gold, the breast and arms of silver, the belly and the thighs of brass. His legs were of iron, and his feet part of iron and part of clay. And you saw until a stone cut out without hands. In other words, no human did it. He cut out supernaturally by God, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay. Now, notice it didn't strike the head. It only struck the feet. I'll explain that in a minute. And broke them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold, broken in pieces together and became as the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind blew it away, and there was no place found from them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain. A mountain, I mentioned to some of you yesterday, is used it's in symbol in the Bible to mean a nation. Became a great nation. 
and filled the whole earth, a great kingdom that will fill the whole earth. Now, actually, that stone was to be Christ. And Christ at his second coming is going to do that. And that hasn't even happened even yet. That is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof to the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. Now, there's a purpose in this. Here was a Gentile. God had had Israel and Judah to be his nations, and they had both failed him. They had refused to obey the Constitution or the basic law of their government, which was the law of God, the way of give, the way of outflowing love. And they wouldn't live that way. And now here was the Gentile that had built the greatest world empire, and God was going to give this Gentile king a chance to see if he would surrender to God, and God would then let this Gentile be his servant and put in the government of God over the, uh, the earth. Now King Nebuchadnezzar is being given a chance like Adam had been given a chance originally. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven has he given unto thine hand, and hath made thee, that is this King Nebuchadnezzar, ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. The head of gold then represented Nebuchadnezzar and his kingdom, the Chaldean Empire, or it's often called in ancient history Babylon, the kingdom of Babylon. And its capital was the city of Babylon, which is almost destroyed. It's near Iraq, or it's near uh, Baghdad, I mean, today. Now, Thou art this head of gold, and after thee shall arise another kingdom, another government, another people or nation, inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which will bear rule over all the earth. Now, that was the image, and as the image comes on down, we find a time sequence. The head of gold was 604 B.C., after that was to come the Persian Empire, and after that the uh, uh, Greco-Macedonian Empire. And the fourth kingdom, there will be a fourth, and that was Rome from 31 B.C. on. It shall be strong as iron. Now notice as it, as it went on down, silver is a little stronger than gold, but it is not as valuable. In character, spiritually, they were less and less valuable as time went along. They were degenerating. But in physical power and strength, they were getting stronger. Silver is harder than gold. And brass is stronger and harder than silver. And now iron is stronger and harder than any, but it's less of value. A piece of iron doesn't cost much, but the same size chunk of gold would be worth an awful lot of money today. You see? But pure gold is very soft. It's not strong at all. The fourth kingdom be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaks in pieces and subdues all things, and as iron that breaks all these, shall it break in pieces. The fourth then was the Roman Empire that was going to uh, rule over all of these other kingdoms, and they would have been gone. The Persian Empire, the Greco-Macedonian Empire, they were all gone. And whereas thou sawest the feet of toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron. Now imagine, the toes were the very last part of it, and it is the toes that were to be struck by Christ when he comes. And here's a time sequence of governments of the earth that it's talking about. But there shall be in it the strength of the iron, for as much as you saw the iron mixed with miry clay. And in the toes of the feet, part of iron, part of clay, so the kingdom will be partly strong and partly weak. And whereas, as you saw the iron mixed with miry clay, they'll mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave to one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. Now, those toes represent the government that I say is going to come 
to restore the Holy Roman Empire, and they won't stay together. They won't stay together but a matter of days or, or a few weeks at the most. Because some of them are strong. Germany is pretty strong, but some of these nations are going to be pretty weak. And they won't stay together. Now, here's a prophecy of all of this. And if you're going to live to see this happen. And in the days of these kings of the toes, now, that hasn't happened yet, and I'm just waiting for that to come to pass. Now, to understand it fully, you've got to go to the 7th chapter of Daniel, the 13th chapter of Revelation, and the 17th of Revelation. Put them all together, and then you really understand it. And I don't know anyone else that does understand it. I really don't. And in the days of the kings, of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom. Now, God has already set up a kingdom in the days of those kings, and that is the government of God in God's church. And he's put me here to organize it, and I'm the instrument he's been using. Now, just, just remember this. It's, it's more important than you possibly can dream. This is not some fanatic's wild dream. This is the truth. And it's the truth that no one has had for 1,900 years on the earth. Set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. Of course, the, now that kingdom won't really be here till Christ comes and he will set it up. It isn't just, but this church is going to go ahead right in and be part of that kingdom. We'll be immortal in that time. We won't be human beings. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it will break in pieces and consume all of these kingdoms. In other words, the governments of Europe and the kingdoms of men on this earth. And it shall stand forever. Well, that's enough. There's more of it, but that covers the story right there in the second chapter. Now then, let's go on to the seventh chapter. And there are things along in the third and fourth and fifth chapters that also fit in with it, but there are more details that we don't need to go into and have time to go into and cover all of this, of course, in this one study today. But now in the seventh chapter of Daniel, I'll begin with verse 3 to just to save what time I can, because we don't have time to cover every word, of course. Uh, well, I have to begin a little bit in the first verse. In the first year of Belshazzar, the king of Babylon. Now, this is later. Belshazzar was a king that succeeded Nebuchadnezzar. This is after Nebuchadnezzar is dead. That Daniel has this dream himself now. You see what I just read? The king had the dream, and Daniel told him what the dream was. But this time, Daniel has the dream himself, the young Jewish lad. In the first year of Belshazzar, the king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions. And Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven strove upon the great sea. Now, you'll find that John has a vision in Revelation 13, and he saw a beast rise up out of the sea while he was standing on the seashore. And four great beasts, or wild animals, came up from the sea, different one from another. Now, the first was like a lion. It was only like a lion. It doesn't say it was a lion. It was like a lion. And it had eagle's wings. I'm going to skip what I can and just read the essential parts because I want to just kind of skim through. And it's interesting if you have the time to go through every bit of it, but we don't have the time to cover the ground I want to cover in this Bible study. And then behold another beast, the second like to a bear. as another wild animal. Now you're going to see that that first animal, which was like a lion, which is the king of beasts, represented Nebuchadnezzar, was the same as the head of gold of the statue. The second, which is a bear, is the same as the breast of, of silver. 
In other words, he's talking about the four great world empires. The second one, then, was like a bear. And uh, after this I beheld, I'm down to verse 6 now, and lo, another like a leopard, which had upon his back four wings of a fowl, and the beast had also four heads. And dominion was given to it. Dominion. See, it's talking about a government that had dominion to rule. The governments that were influenced by Satan, that God told Adam that his children would have these governments. Now, here they are coming along. These are the main governments that were world governments. After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly, and he had great iron teeth. Now, this iron compares to the iron legs of the other beasts. The iron legs were the Roman Empire that had a capital in the west at Rome, a capital in the east at Constantinople. And it was, it was the two, the east and the west, but they were all Roman Empire. I considered the... Now, let's see. And... Uh, before it, and there were ten horns. Now, you want, to, you want you to notice, the first beast had a head, was like a lion. The second was like a bear and had a head. Now you got two heads. The third beast like a, was a leopard, but the leopard had four heads, and now you've got six heads. Now there is a seventh one to come up, and that makes uh, seven heads, but on the seventh one are ten horns. Now, with that, I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn. Another little horn that came up among these other horns. Before whom were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. Now, I can tell you who it represented, but I can't take time to go into all of it. The fourth beast, then, was the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire really fell in 476 A.D. And uh, there were three. The little horn is the Roman Catholic Church. And before it, there were three that uh, were plucked up by the roots. They're gone. You can't find any trace of them in history. They were the Heruli, the Ostrogoths, and the Vandals. Where are the Vandals today? Where are the Ostrogoths? Where are the Heruli? You can't find them. They were wild animals. Let me go back and read that now. And I beheld until the thrones of these governments now, represented by these wild animals, who had the characteristics of wild animals, not of tame animals, were cast down. The Ancient of Days did sit. That is God, the Ancient of Days, and whose garment was white as snow, which is, is a symbol in the Bible of purity and righteousness and holiness. And the hair of his head was a pure wool. His throne was like a fiery flame, and his wheels like burning fire. God has a throne. God is the, the one who governs the whole universe. I beheld then because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake. I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. Now, as concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season. The people went on, but their government was taken away and destroyed. You see? Now, verse 13. And I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, that's Christ, came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, that is, to God the Father. And they brought him near unto him, they brought Christ near unto God the Father. And uh, there was given unto him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people and nations, all the nations of the earth now, and all languages should serve him and uh, his dominion 
is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. That is the kingdom of God when Christ will come, and that's going to happen in your lifetime, you younger people. And I've always thought it would happen in my lifetime, and it may if God keeps me alive that long, which he can do if he wants to. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit in the midst of my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near unto uh, one of them that stood by, that's an angel in his dream, and asked him the truth of all of this. So he told me and made me to know the interpretation of these things. These great beasts, or these wild animals, which are four, are four kings, or four kingdoms. Now, they represent four kingdoms, starting with the Chaldean Empire of 604 B.C., 604 years before Christ. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. The saints are the church. Many of the saints are dead. That includes Peter and Paul and John and Andrew and Philip. They're going to be resurrected. That includes the church today. We're going to be there. I expect to be there. Now, if you like the governments and the, the way on earth today, and you want the agony as well as the ecstasy, you can have it. I don't want it. You can have it. If you want to be sick at your stomach and vomit and throw up and then go and eat your own vomit, go ahead and do it. I don't want it. I want the way of God, the right way, the happy way. That's the way I'm going to live. But the saints of the Most High are going to take over all the governments. That's why we have to have government in the church. We're going to rule the rest of the nation. We have to learn how to govern and how to be governed in the church now today. And you'll notice that many of them that have gone out of the church, their whole trouble is they don't like the government. They don't want the government of God. They want the government of man. Then I would know the truth about the fourth wild animal or beast, which was different from all of the others, exceedingly dreadful, and so on. And of the ten horns that were in his uh, head, and of the others which came up, that little horn, before whom three fell, and of that horn that had eyes and a mouth that spoke great things, which really represented the papacy and, and the Roman Catholic Church, whose look uh, was more stout than his fellows. I beheld, in the same horn, made war with the saints. And in history they have. They put the saints to death. The Catholic Church persecuted and put the saints to death. That's the history of the Catholic Church. That's why God calls her a great whore, full of blasphemies, and the worst things that even God could call anyone. It's the worst counterfeit that ever happened. Until the Ancient of Days, that's uh, when Christ came, and judgment was given unto the saints of the Most High. We're going to do the judging. Then he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth, the fourth of these great world-ruling kingdoms, or the Roman Empire. And shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down, and break it in pieces. And that's exactly what the Roman Empire did. And the ten horns, now get this, the ten horns out of that kingdom, that was that seventh head now, of the Roman Empire, are ten kings, or kingdoms, that shall arise. And another shall arise after them, that was the papacy now, and after them. But before the bishops of Rome, the Heruli, the Ostrogoths, and the Vandals were cast out and plucked up with the roots. You can't find any trace of them today. They're gone. and shall subdue three kings. That was the Vandals, the Ostrogoths, and the Heruli. 
and he shall speak great words against the Most High. They call him the Most Holy Father. The Pope is not holy even. That's blasphemy to call him. God is the Most Holy Father, but they call the Pope that. I say that that is blasphemy. And if they had the power, they'd lop my head off for saying that. That's what they would do. And shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. They have changed the calendar. They have changed the time. They've changed the law of God. They've changed the Sabbath to Sunday. That's why they observe Sunday today. And the, the bishops of the Catholic Church and the cardinals say that you can search the Bible from beginning to end and you can't find a word telling you to observe Sunday. I know that's what I started to search the Bible for to prove to my wife the Bible said you shall keep Sunday. It doesn't say it anywhere. You can't find it. I tried and I couldn't find it. But things will be given into his hand for time, time, the dividing of time, that is. A time is 360 years. And times, in other words, it's a total of a dividing of time or half a time. It's the total of 1,260 years, if you figure it out. And it was exactly that long in history. But the judgment shall sit, and uh, they shall take away his dominion and consume it to destroy it unto the end. And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven, that's earth wide, the whole earth, shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. That is God's church. And the saints that are already dead will be resurrected. That will start back with old Father Abraham and the prophets of the Old Testament and the apostles of the New. They'll be resurrected, and the kingdom, the government, will be given to them. An everlasting kingdom and all dominions shall serve and obey them. Now, you see, you've got that as a background. Now we turn on to the 13th chapter of Revelation. The book of Revelation. And the 13th chapter of Revelation ties right up to it. Now, of course, there's a whole time sequence in Revelation. It'd be nice to begin at the first of Revelation. And the second and third are the messages of Christ about the seven epochs and uh, eras of the church. And the fourth shows the, and the fifth shows the throne of God. The sixth shows the opening of the seals. And the seventh and eighth and ninth and so on show the, the things of the time of beginning of the day of the Lord. The book of Revelation all, all about the time when God begins to intervene in world affairs. Now, here the 13th chapter of the book of Revelation. And John is telling what he saw in vision. He seemed to think he was taken in vision to... Uh, well, he was on the island of Patmos when this vision came to him. But the time of his vision, it was set at a certain time, and he was seeing things of about 19... Uh, I think about 1934, about 1934, 33 or 34. 34 was the first year of the, was a full year of the life of the Worldwide Church of God. It was founded in 1933, but it really more or less started in August, but it was not even set up and organized until in October of 1933. 34 would have been the very first year. And that is the time setting of this. And it just all the more gets back to, uh, uh, to this very church. Very, very significant. Now, John is telling what he saw in vision in the book of Revelation. And, and the whole thing is about the day of the Lord when God begins to intervene. And that hasn't happened yet. We're just it's right ahead, just a few years ahead. Maybe three, four years, but very, very close. And I stood upon the sand of the sea, 
And I saw a beast, now again a wild animal, rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. Here are your seven heads and ten horns all over again. And you see, there were the four parts of, of, of the image in Daniel 2, and the ten toes instead of ten horns. You see how these things all fit together. And upon his horns, ten crowns, and upon his heads, the names of blasphemy, showing that they're of Satan the devil, and they're very evil. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. It wasn't a leopard, it was just like a leopard. His feet were the feet of a bear, that's the strongest part of a bear. His mouth was the mouth of a lion, that's the mouth is the strongest part of a lion. And the dragon, which is the devil, gave him his power. Now, you turn over here into the twelfth chapter. Oh, turn back. The twelfth chapter. It says, uh, There was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought on his angels. Let's see. But the dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. So you see, the dragon is the devil. I don't have to, it's not my interpretation. The Bible just says so in plain language. I just give you what the Bible says, not my interpretation. Now, this beast was like a leopard. A leopard's body is quick and cat like, quicker than any animal, any big animal, wild animal. His feet were the, like the strongest part of a bear, his feet, and his mouth, like a lion, is the strongest part of a lion. And the dragon, or the devil, gave him his power, his seat, and great authority. God said, go form your own governments. But the devil is the one who has led men to form these governments, and they're all based on get, not give. They're all based on competition. They're all based on everyone trying to get for himself. That's the world you live in. And I saw one of his heads. Now, there's seven heads and ten horns, remember. One of his heads, as it were, wounded to death. That's the seventh head. That was the Roman Empire. And the, it, the wounded to death, the death of the Roman Empire was 476 A.D. Now, remember, 476 A.D. Any history will give you that. Check it up. You don't have to take my word for it. And his deadly wound was healed. It was healed in 554, when the Pope at Rome had Justinian, who was uh, emperor over at Constantinople, come to Rome and reform the, the Roman government in the West. And now they call it the Holy Roman Empire because the Pope sat on top of the whole heap. And it was a union of church and state beginning 554 A.D. Now, remember, three of the first governments, the Heruli, the Ostrogoths, and Vandals, had been plucked up by the roots. They're gone. It leaves seven more, doesn't it? The first of those was Justinian, the first of those seven. I saw one of the beasts, as it were, wounded death. That was the original beast. Let's see. And they wondered, they worshipped the dragon, or the, the devil, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? That's what they will say. The United States of Europe will come up, and it will be a stronger power than Russia. It will be a stronger power than the Soviet. It will be a stronger power than the United States. I don't know things that are happening just since the election day three days ago. It may be a little longer than I thought before all this happens. Maybe I'm not going to live to see it. I don't know, but it, you can be sure it'll happen. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things. That is the beast. The mouth given to him is that of the Pope speaking great things. It isn't that the beast or the, the ruler, the emperor, had the mouth speaking great things. That mouth was the papacy. And blasphemies, because they call the pope the most holy father. 
and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. Now, that began in 554, and it lasted 1260 years, forty and two months, counted out. It began in 554. It ended at Waterloo, where I was for lunch the day before yesterday. Napoleon. Power was given them to continue 42 months. Napoleon met his Waterloo, as they say, his final defeat at Waterloo in 1814. That's exactly the 42 months of the Bible, or 1260 years. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and uh, his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints, which the Catholic Church did do, and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations, different nations speaking different languages. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, now, that is coming to pass yet again that this is talking about. Shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world, all except truly converted Christians. If any man uh, have an ear, let him hear. He that leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He that kills with a sword will be killed with a sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb. Now, a lamb is a symbol of Christ, a tame animal. Christ is called the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. They used to sacrifice the lamb. And Christ's life was sacrificed for us. He is the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world, and to use a Bible expression. And he had two horns like a lamb. Now, this, this other uh, beast actually is a wild animal coming up out of the earth. But he had two horns like a lamb, and a lamb is a tame animal, but the animal is a wild animal. But he spoke as a dragon. He, he pretended he was the servant of Christ, or in place of Christ. Actually, vicar of Christ, which is the Pope's title, means in place of Christ. It means they've knocked Christ off, and the Pope is in his place and has, has taken Christ's place. And Christ is kicked out. That's what that really means. So they worship Mary instead of Christ. And uh, here's this other beast now. And he exercised all the power of the first beast before him. The first beast before him was the revived Roman Empire, 554 to 1814. And it was the papacy that exercised the power and sat on top of the heap. You see? And causeth the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast. He only caused it, but he caused them to worship the, the Roman Empire, whose deadly wound was healed, the Holy Roman Empire. And he, which is now this, uh, this papacy, doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire to come down from heaven on the earth and the sight of men. And that is yet to happen. And you're going to find that happening soon. When you do, remember I told you. And he deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles that he had the power to do in the sight of the beast, saying, and, and that, that's what the Pope will do in the sight of the man that will be the ruler of the revived Holy Roman Empire or the united Europe that is coming up, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by the sword and did live. Now, an image is a replica and a representation, a copy, an image. And the beast is a government. And that image is a government. And it is the Vatican, which is a government. And it is a government as well as a church. 
Do you realize that? Now, they have a guard that are called the um, Swiss Guards, that if we get to stop off in Rome, you will see the Swiss Guards marching all around St. Peter's in Rome. And Rome is both church and state. And nations send their uh, ambassadors to Rome, not to the church, but to the government. And Vatican City is a little, tiny, small government in part of the city of Rome. And it itself is a separate city, a separate government. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, which now is the Vatican, and the civil government of the Roman Catholic Church. The image of the beast, which is this Vatican, should both speak and cause as many as should not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He is not going to kill them. He causes them to be killed. He will pronounce them heretics, and the civil government soldiers will put them to death. That's the way they used to do it. Hundreds of years ago, in the old the civil Roman Empire used to do that. And he, which is the same papacy, or, uh, yes, causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in the right hand and in the forehead. And that is the observance of Sunday instead of the Sabbath. And I can prove that. And that's, that'll take longer than I've taken in all of this so far in this study, much longer. But I do have it. I have it all written. I'm going to revive it again and get that booklet out again. In the right hand or in the foreheads. In other words, the right hand symbolizes labor. This is all symbolical. The forehead is in your mind. And that no man might buy or sell, save he had the mark or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. You won't be able to do business or buy or sell anything. It's going to be a terrible time. We won't be able to keep the Sabbath if we're still here. That's why the Bible shows that this church, this Philadelphia era, is going to be taken away where we'll be clear out of their jurisdiction. And if the Bible shows us any place we're going to go, it's down in the wilderness of Petra. But I'm not sure that's it. And, and I'm not sure the Bible shows us where it'll be. But if it does, that's the place. Here is wisdom. Let him that understandeth count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. And his number is 666. 666. Additional programs and literature available at hwalibrary.com.